Good morning, honored guests, veterans, color guard, GRTC units, and the HUD family here at the headquarters and throughout the HUD by live webcast. Thank you for attending the 2016 Veterans Day ceremony and the 50th anniversary commemoration of the Vietnam War. Our theme for this year's ceremony is honoring all who have served. My name is Eugene Gino Harris II, and I'm a combat veteran and a retired Air Force officer who served in the Medical Service Corps. Previously, I was assigned as a program manager with the Air Force Surgeon General's Office at the Pentagon. And I currently hold a position as a senior project manager with housing operations. It is my pleasure to co MC this event along with my wingman and fellow veteran, Ms. Mary Tobin. Mary. Thank you, Gino. My name is Mary Tobin, and I'm also a combat veteran and a retired Army communications officer who served in the Army Signal Corps. Previously, I served as a network manager for the proud United States Marine Corps in Okinawa, Japan, and I currently hold a position as a management information specialist in the Office of Housing Operations. I am extremely honored to co-host this event with my incredible colleague, Gino, and I know that everyone here will truly enjoy today's ceremony. Thank you, Mary. At this time, we will have the presentation of colors by the Military District of Washington Joint Forces Color Guard, assisted by the John F. Kennedy High School Navy Junior ROTC Unit. The Pledge of Allegiance and the National the Pledge of Allegiance led by Ms. Ebony Johnson, the National Anthem sung by Mr. Charles Terry, and the invocation given by Rabbi Schnitzer. If able, please stand and remain standing for these presentations, beginning with the national anthem, including the parts of the color guard and the invocation. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we won were so gallantly streaming and the rockets that glare the bombs they're bursting in air gave proof through the night that I fled was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land? Please repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic 
for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. The prayer I prepared for this morning after the events of the last 24 hours needed a little tightening. If I know where all of our hearts and minds are this morning as we enter a new chapter in our nation's history. So I will offer two invocations this morning. First, a prayer for the day after. Modanu anile fanecha, we are thankful before you, God. I thank you for this most amazing day. The sun came out, the birds are singing, and the world did not stop. Thank you for enabling us to reach this day full of wonder and promise, full of expectation and responsibility, full of courage and hope. Thank you for teaching us, for leading us, for giving us a vision of a world redeemed, a world of promise, a world of hope, a world of opportunity, where everyone is created in your image, where children do not go to bed hungry, where housing is secure, where learning is inspired, where the earth is plentiful, where everyone can sit under their vine and fig tree and none shall make them afraid, where we are partners with you. God, full of compassion, the God of dignity and strength, watch over our veterans of the United States Armed Forces in recognition of their loyal service to our nation. Bless them with wholeness and with love. Shelter them, heal their wounds, comfort their hearts, grant them peace. God of justice and truth, rock of our lives, bless our veterans those men and women of courage and valor with a deep and abiding understanding of our profound gratitude. Protect them and their families from loneliness and want. Grant them lives of joy and bounty. And may their dedication and honor be remembered always as a blessing from generation to generation. Blessed are you, our protector and redeemer, our shield and our strength. Let us all say, Amen. Please be seated. Thank you to the cadets, and thank you to everyone who participated in the opening of our ceremony. At this time, I would like to draw our attention to the POW MIA table. This is how we pay tribute to our comrades who were taken as prisoners of war or are still listed as missing in action. The POW MIA table is reserved to honor our missing loved ones. The empty place setting represents military service members from each branch of service, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and the Coast Guard, still missing in action. This tribute symbolizes that they are here with us here in spirit, and Americans should never forget the brave men and women who answered our nation's call to serve. Please stand if you're able and remain standing as Mr. Kirk Holmes from the Bugles Across America does our call to assembly. Please stand. Please be seated. I would like to explain today the meaning of the items on the table. 
The table is round to show our everlasting concern for our missing men and women. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their motives when answering the call to duty. The single red rose displayed in a vase reminds us of the life of each of the missing and their loved ones and friends of these Americans who keep the faith awaiting answers. The vase is tied with a red ribbon, symbol of our continued determination to account for our missing. A slice of lemon on the bread plate is to remind us of the bitter fate of those who were captured and missing in a foreign land. A pinch of salt symbolizes the tears endured by those missing and their families who seek answers. And the Bible represents the strength gained through faith to sustain those lost from our country, founded as one nation under God. The glass is inverted to symbolize their inability to share this evening, this morning's toast. And the chairs are empty because our brave men and women are missing. Thank you for helping me to honor our comrades and may we never forget their brave, brave sacrifice. At this time, I would like to introduce to you Ms. Karen Newton Cole, who currently serves as the Director of the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Utilization. Ms. Newton Cole is responsible for promoting small business utilization within the Department of Housing and Urban Development, conducting marketing and outreach activities, ensuring compliance with small business regulation, and serving as the Ombudsman for Small Business Related Matters. Ms. Newton Cole has served in several executive leadership positions, including as the Deputy Chief Human Capital Officer and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Operations and Management. We will now ask Director Karen Newton Cole to come forward and give today's opening remarks. Welcome, Director Newton Cole. Good morning, everybody. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome you for our visitors to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. It is indeed a pleasure to see visitors and guests, and even our own HUD family out there in the audience. This is one of my favorite times of year. Not only do we have the fall with the beautiful leaves and the colors, but also this is the time of year that we have an opportunity to honor our veterans who served in, in the armed services. I am also reminded that it's near the Marine Corps birthday for the Marine Corps <laughs> veterans in the audience. And, and this is just a wonderful time. As I look around the room, I see many of you who have served in the armed services and others of you who are part of, just part of the HUD family. When you think about veterans, you think about the wars that they've served in, the battles that they have gone into, how they have served to defend our country and all of the wonderful things that they have done for us. And they are truly the backbone of the United States. But not just that, because once they have left the armed services, they've gone on to do everything, other things, such as here in the department. I know several people who are veterans. I've worked with them. I, I have had opportunities to work out with them. <laughs> and that's one of the places where I meet a lot of the new veterans to the department is in the fitness center. But when I think about veterans, I think about the special things that they bring to this department. What they bring to this department is a richness, experience, things that we don't know about, they know about. And the one thing that I am always impressed about when it comes to veterans is not only the, just the richness of their knowledge, but their organizational capability the fact that they're very organized, very disciplined as a general rule, and they take pride of work, pride of workmanship. Their work ethic is usually unparalleled, and this you see in everyday things that they do. 
the experiences that they bring to the department makes the department so much better than it otherwise would have been. Regardless of whether or not they are your friends, your coworkers, your brothers, your sisters, your fathers, your mothers, or other friends, they are so rich and they bring so much and they are so worth celebrating. This is the time of year that we get to celebrate them. We get to honor them and tell them how much we appreciate their service and let them know we know that without them, we are so empty. And it's not just about the battles they fight, but what they bring to the table, their leadership capabilities, the ability to lead no matter what position you're in, and all the things that come along with being a veteran of the United States. So I want to say welcome to each one of you, and let's take this time to truly celebrate and say thank you. Thank you, Director Newton Cole, for those remarks. Now, it is a great honor that I introduce U.S. Army Major Beatrice Flores. She currently serves as the Chief of Supply and Services Joint Task Force National Capital Region in support of the 58th Presidential Inauguration, scheduled to take place January 20, 2017. Major Flores is a McAllen, Texas native and current pageant winner of the Miss Texas Belleza Latina 2016. Let's welcome Major Beatrice Flores. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to celebrate Veterans Day with you. Last week, I celebrated my 12th year of service in the United States Army Reserve. I first received the call to serve when I was a junior in high school. I was in my first period English class when I first saw the news reports of the attacks on 9-11. I had many mixed feelings and thoughts. It was hard to make sense of it all. But there was one thing that I knew for certain. I was determined that I was going to serve in the United States military. It was my calling. Three years later, I enlisted. Two years after that, I commissioned, and three years later, I found myself in Afghanistan. Not many people receive a call to serve. In fact, less than 1% of the US population is currently serving in the military. Those few who have served, or who are currently serving, have sacrificed so much for this country. Today, we honor those few, our veterans. Veterans Day is an amazing holiday during which we get to thank our veterans for their service and their sacrifice. But I challenge you to not forget our veterans the remaining 364 days of the year. As a civilian, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I've had the opportunity to work with veterans. I'm very familiar with their needs and the challenges they face. An average of 20 veterans commit suicide each day. 20% of veterans that have fought in a war have suffered with a mental illness. 8.6% of our homeless population are veterans. And close to 500,000 veterans are unemployed. So as a community, we need to work together to ensure that we are taking care of our veterans. So celebrate them today, but do not forget them tomorrow. To all our veterans in the audience, thank you so much for your courage, your sacrifice, and your service. I am honored to be a sister in arms. Thank you. Thank you, Major Flores, for those special remarks. I am now pleased to introduce to you Lisa Taylor, the Senior Liaison Specialist for the Veterans History Project of the American Folklife Center at the United States Library of Congress. The Veterans History Project is a congressionally mandated program now in its 16th year, which collects, preserves, 
and makes accessible the first person recollections of America's wartime veterans. Mrs. Taylor believes that all United States military veterans are heroes, no matter their branch, rank, role, gender, race, or age. And each deserves the opportunity to tell his or her own story in his or her own words. So please help me welcome Mrs. Lisa Taylor as she gives the call to action. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of um, the newly appointed Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, and the new Director of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, Karen Lloyd, I bring you greetings from just a few blocks up the street. I am so pleased and honored to be here with you today. And I would like to thank Mr. Walter Elmore, and Mr. Dwayne Campbell and all of the members of the Veterans Affinity Group for the invitation to participate in this special day. As a civilian and the daughter of a Vietnam era veteran, I couldn't be more thrilled to be with you today. And I do not take this opportunity lightly. So usually when we think about a call to action, uh, we relate it to some kind of sales or marketing campaign. We've all heard the television and radio commercials, call now, act now. Um, they do that because they realize, based on market research, that um, when you put a sense of urgency on um, a requirement for people, they're more likely to act. Therefore, they're more likely to spend money immediately. I'm not asking you for any of your money today, just a little bit of your time, and I want to tell you why. This is the call of action for today. This Veterans Day, if you are a veteran, or if you are the loved one of a veteran, you should participate in the Veterans History Project. So if you are a veteran, share your story with the Veterans History Project. Sit down with someone, a loved one, a colleague, um, a child who's at least in 10th grade or 15 years old. Tell them what you experienced, whatever that was, good, bad, or indifferent. Let them know what you went through as you serve your, your military experience. If you are a civilian, find a veteran the statistics tell us that at least 61% of Americans have a, a relative who is a veteran. So the odds are that you know a veteran and they're probably in your family. Sit down with them this Veterans Day, interview them, talk to them about their military days, record that conversation with a tape recorder or a video camera or smart device, which most of us have these days, and get that conversation recorded, preserved, so that we can have it for future generations. To date, the Veterans History Project holds at least 100,000 of these stories. They're all archived at the Library of Congress. 31,000 of those are fully accessible, meaning they're digitized on our website. But every single one of those 100,000 or more veterans has a summary page on our website. When you participate, you will become one of the people included in that archive so that researchers, teachers, students, authors, filmmakers, Anyone, members of your family 100 years from now will be able to hear exactly what you had to say about your own service. So what I'm presenting to you today is a rare opportunity for all veterans, like our Mistress of Ceremonies just told you, to tell your own story in your own words, in your own way. We don't accept edited stories. So that means no one can take anything from what you said and they can't add anything to it. If it's edited, we'll send it back. So if you have a story to tell, which I'm sure you do, Share it with us. Think about that this Veterans Day and then the holidays that are coming up right behind it. When you're gathering with family members, loved ones, traveling all around the country or around the world, if there's a US veteran in your life, get that story recorded. That's your call to action today. I wanna to thank you for your time and I'll be looking for all these stories to come across my desk. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that call to action. I myself didn't find out that my stepfather had been a Korean War veteran until I was 16. And so now as a combat veteran, I'm able to share those experiences with him. So thank you very much for that. I now have the distinct honor of introducing Mr. Raymond H. Crawley, United States Marine Corps retired of the Oxygen Rescue Care Centers of America. Mr. Raymond Crawley is a physical therapist and a Marine with over 25 years of experience with hyperbaric oxygen in treating conditions such as stroke, cerebral palsy, athletic injuries, memory-related issues, concussions, and autoimmune disorders. 
His long-standing interest in the brain and nervous system has resulted in his hyperbaric oxygen center being the first and the only in the country to be approved by the Veterans Administration to treat military traumatic brain injuries and concussions. Help me please welcome Mr. Crawley as he comes forth with our special comments. It's a great honor to be here before you. Uh, you know, I'm a Vietnam era Marine to shout out to all you fellows, our birthday is tomorrow. Uh, I wanna talk about something very serious uh, we've heard from people about our, our veterans that are on the street. We've heard about the concussive injuries and the silent wound of war. And two things that need to be known uh, across this great country. One, many of our veterans have had a brain injury because of blast exposure. You do not have to be knocked unconscious. We now know through certain types of imaging that blast exposure creates a signature injury in the brain different than the football player concussion or the type of concussions that may happen from other types of trauma. This means that service-related disability is, is identifiable now, and I have had the opportunity with a lot of my colleagues around the country on a pro bono basis to start treating veterans that were suicidal. All of the veterans that I've treated were, had attempted suicide at least once. Without question, every single one of these veterans have never had another suicide attempt. The effects of hyperbaric oxygen are such that many of these people are hyper alert and haven't slept sometimes for years. The first thing that happens within the first four or five treatments is they start sleeping all night. And there's a lot of reasons why that's very healthy for your brain. When you don't sleep, it's a, it, your brain can't function very well. So we do SPECT brain imaging, and we can see that's a metabolic study of the brain. We're trying to get the VA and others support groups to understand that many of our people who can't, I get soldiers and Navy SEALs coming through to see me who, who can't remember what we just said to them five minutes ago. And the VA has got a huge problem on their back. They do a wonderful job in many areas, but upside down, when you can't remember what I just said to you five minutes ago, how much is psychology going to do? So we find that we can repair that brain, memory starts coming back, they start sleeping, and now the other benefits of psychology and psychoactive, those kinds of things seem to help. We get a huge reduction in the use of drugs. Many of the drugs that are handed out to our veterans are black boxed, which is an FDA warning that they create depression. So we have 20 some reported suicides a day. So my office has been seeing veterans from all over the United States who have come to us in rather desperate shape. And without question, every one of these fighting men tell me they don't want to come see me because they know somebody that deserves it more than they do. Many of these fighting men, particularly the special ops folks that get into the most trouble, are, uh, you know, they're warriors. They don't want to tell me that they've been hurt. They don't want to admit it because their psychology and training is such that they don't want to sound weak. We take that SPECT image and we can see clearly what's going on. The process is that you get early onset of dementia and Alzheimer's. So every veteran out there has the right now to go through the VA Choice Program and request this type of treatment. The Florida Veterans Foundation, which I'm very proud to tell, uh, started sending me veterans that were suicidal. The head of that, Colonel Washington Sanchez, was a Vietnam artillery gentleman officer who for 40 years was walking around with traumatic brain injury and didn't know it until we treated, until we imaged his brain. He, they have made a film in Florida of this type of work. It's not just in Florida, but my colleagues around the country are doing this. And so my message is to please let us all understand that these veterans need desperately this type of help. We can have a huge impact on suicide. The next two things to know about is the early diagnosis of concussion. The problem has been we don't know when people are concussed. Well, the good news is they're developing now a biomarker from a drop of blood, and this is gonna go through the NFL. It'll go through our military where we can tell from a drop of blood. There are proteins that live in the brain that don't exist anywhere else. And when you hurt your brain, we can find that drop of blood. And if you have too many of those proteins, we know the extent of the injury that you've had. We know that if we get you within the first three hours of a blast exposure, we can prevent a lot of the damage that happens. So early diagnosis. 
in the works right now, I work with Joe Maroon, the neurosurgeon for the Pittsburgh Steelers, you might have seen in the movie Concussion. We're very much interested in, there's a development of something called QEEG, which measures the brain. And this is a, uh, a hat or a cap that we can put on and look at the brain waves, helping us to determine when a soldier or a football player or a child or anyone else has had a concussion and do this rather, we need more studies on it. We also are looking for funding from other organizations that help us with these veterans. So it's been my gr great pleasure to be here today and share this information with you. Hopefully when you go back, you, you may know loved ones or some of you yourselves may be having memory issues, PTSD symptoms. These are things that we can treat now with hyperbaric oxygen. It's a, and let's all have a great birthday tomorrow at our, and a great Veterans Day the, the next day. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Crawley, for your remarks. I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Rear Admiral Kerry B. Thomas, United States Coast Guard, retired. Rear Admiral Thomas served her nation as a career Coast Guardsman for over 32 years. During her career, she earned command both afloat and ashore. She represented the U.S. in a spectrum of duties, including negotiating international agreements in the Arctic and broadening understanding of Coast Guard authorities in the Asia Pacific Indo region. Her flag assignments included Chief of Response, Chief Human Resources, and Commander, Coast Guard, District 14, Honolulu, Hawaii. Riyadma Thomas currently serves as the National Executive Director of the Navy League of the United States. She graduated with distinction from the Naval War College with a Master of Arts in National Security and Strategic Studies. Her awards include the Distinguished Service Medal, two Legions of Merit, and the Department of State Superior Honor Award. Let's welcome our keynote speaker, Rear Admiral Thomas. Thank you all, it's a real privilege to be here. What a night last night, huh? If, if nothing else, weren't we united by huddling around our TVs really to watch the results? And I think we were also united in wanting it to just all be over. Um, but I must be honest, I think what I wanted was to just watch Alex Baldwin for the next four years on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you know, today is the first day to for me to have sharing my story as a veteran. Yesterday was my first day to vote as a veteran, and so I'm here to share a little bit about my story. I wore my military uniform for almost 36 years, including my four years at the Coast Guard Academy, until I retired back in July. Of course, I was three years old when I joined. <laughs> Why did I join? Well, I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. But there's only one Jacques Cousteau, so I started looking around and thinking about where I wanted to uh, go to college. Went off to the Coast Guard Academy, and I heard that they had great opportunities for women even back then in the late 70s. As long as there was a place to sleep or go to the bathroom, there were no restrictions in the Coast Guard all those years ago. So I thought I'd get my education, get a family, get out. I got my education, I got my family, and I forgot to get out until just very recently. I proceeded to vote in nine presidential elections by absentee ballot until yesterday. And as I reflect on those nearly four decades in service to our nation, I wondered how a young girl could become an admiral and then earn the status of veteran. I think there's really four things. The first thing is access. Now, changes to integration in our military didn't happen by themselves. In fact, generally, the military was opposed to women serving. But in 1948, after the war, our Congress did pass a law allowing for women to serve in non-combat roles. They weren't allowed to be married, and they weren't allowed to be pregnant. But slowly over time, barriers began to break down. And only after Congress uh, told the military to do it or the Supreme Court uh, ordered it to be done did it occur. By the 1960s, more progress had been made, but there was still one prohibition, and that was women were not allowed to be admirals or generals. 
So you ask why that is? Well, of course you know. As you reach your late 40s or early 50s, as you approach the age of menopause, we know that women could never make good strategic decisions because they all lose their minds, right? <laughs> By 1979, the first woman commanded a Coast Guard ship. Uh, there were no restrictions, and I'm proud to be a product of that access that was provided to me. Access, next is opportunity. Women veterans need to be allowed the opportunity to do all jobs. It requires good supervisors. It requires good performance. It requires an organization to commit the integration of women through its policies and its procedures. It requires a willingness to just try. Some succeed and others fail. Steps forward are sometimes followed by steps backwards, but in the end, the opportunity, having access, if you don't have access, the opportunity will mean nothing. I had bosses who gave me chances. They held me to high standards, they encouraged me when I struggled, they praised me when I did well, and they cared. They cared that I did well at work, and they cared when I got married, and later when I got pregnant. They wondered how a new mother of a six-month-old could go out to sea on a ship for months at a time but they didn't say I couldn't, and so I did. It's no surprise that I grew up in the military. I was a Girl Scout. And you think about Girl Scouts, they wear uniforms, they wear badges, they pledge their flag, they serve their country and their community. I've been blessed with extraordinary ex experiences and that have taken me to extraordinary places. And I'm truly proud to stand here today as a veteran as the captain of a ship during the last mass migration of the United States, I was confronted with a sea of humanity. People on rafts and boats of all type, everywhere you looked, there was just a sea of humanity in front of you. And, it, and I never failed to appreciate the fact that when they would cross my deck of the ship, having left their homes with nothing but the clothes on their back, maybe a family Bible and a little bit money to make it, a life in our country, uh, in the United States. I've put drug smugglers in jail. I visited Guadalcanal, where the only Coast Guardsman to earn the Medal of Honor was killed in the line of duty. I've had to tell families that we will no longer be able to search for their loved ones lost at sea. None of this would have been possible had I not been given an opportunity over and over. Third, no one ch achieves executive status without both education and training. None of our careers in the military, and all you veterans in here know this, you've had extensive time in the classroom. Academic courses of study are important to gain both technical expertise as well as a time of reflection. And training tools are key in whatever field that you preserve. All are helpful to broaden your understanding, but it's also important to broaden your network. And one of the takeaways that I had on a course that I had was that there's no such thing as a new problem. It's only a new problem to you. That's why these networks are important, because when you get stuck on an issue, whether coworker, boss, husband, wife, whoever, others have lived it, and they're there to help you. Finally, leadership has been key to my uh, achieving the status. Can it be learned? Of course. Are there others who are more drawn to leadership? Sure. Uh, as a teenager, I, was, I found myself in charge of some number of events uh, in school. But I went to the Coast Guard Academy. I found myself nearly expelled because I didn't know how to be a good follower. And being a good follower and teammate is a critical part of being a good leader. Later, I had someone tell me that I was very motherly in my leadership style. And I didn't quite know how to react to that. Uh, but when it was explained to me that I was caring and compassionate, but that I was also a tough disciplinarian, I realized that that does describe the kind of leader that I am. But I, like many of you, are always on a quest to be better than I am. And the one thing I'm comfortable with now, that I am human, and that I'm 54 years old, and that I am not perfect. I think it's the humanity in, a, in us all that helps us understand where we fit, who we are in the larger scheme of things. So in all my imperfection, Oprah and I have lost the same 20 pounds more times in my life than I care to admit to. I have at least three sizes in my closet. 
I have the dang you look good size. I have the I'm over 50 and I am what I am size. And then I have the good grief, look what happens now that McDonald's is open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner size. I often forget that to be a good citizen, a good wife, and a good mother is to be good to myself. So I could tell all stories, a lot of stories all day about the things that I've done and that my journey continues to evolve. But I could have worked in the industry, I could have worked in, as a civil servant in the government, but I decided to continue my service in the nonprofit sector. The Navy League is an organization of about 40,000 volunteers, about 220 councils around the country and around the world. They educate the public for why you need a strong Navy, Coast Guard, Marine, and Merchant Marines. The Navy League advocates for and supports the sea services, their families, and their youth. They do important work at the local level and at the national level, and they're making a difference every day. Some are veterans, and others are just patriots who want to give back. So if you want to do your part, consider joining us and checking us out at www.navyleague.org. I'm so privileged to be with you here today as a veteran. So when you park your car at Harris Teeter and you see a woman getting out of her car in that veteran parking place, you tell her thank you. I'm grateful to be an American who lives in a country whose political system is transparent, representative, and provides access, opportunity, training, and leadership to its veterans. Men and women, blacks and whites, Christians and Jews, gays and straights, Republican and Democrat alike. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Thanks to the HUD Veterans Affinity Group for putting this together. Semper Paratus, happy birthday, U.S. Marine Corps, and go Navy, beat Army. First of all, ma'am, go Army, beat Navy. <laughs> Who? I've been waiting all day to say who. Um, <laughs> thank you, Rear Admiral Thomas, uh, for those inspiring words. Thank you for paving the way for me. I'm a West Point graduate, and those women that started in the Coast Guard Academy, Naval Academy in West Point, and Air Force Academy, you are our heroes. So thank you very much. It is now uh, my pleasure uh, to honor our 2016 HUD Veterans Recognition nominees. So from the HUD field, excuse me, I'm gonna back up. We're gonna do something special. We have some very honored and distinguished gentlemen here uh, today in our, in our audience. And I want to first bring up Miss Natalie Bishop to give us a spoken word that will speak to their sacrifice and the sacrifices of all veterans. Good morning. To my fellow veterans from the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard, I salute you. From the conflict of 1775 through the conflicts of today, we have been men and women of courage, of faith, of service, and of sacrifice. We are valiant men and women who have fought, we've won, we've lost, some have been wounded, some have been dishonored, some have been disrespected, some are still missing, and some have paid the ultimate sacrifice. For this moment, for this country, for you, for me, for them, for us, for those who've gone on before us, and those who are yet coming. So as I take a glimpse in the eyes, in the heart, and in the memories of our veterans, I still see hope. I still see courage, I still see sacrifice, and I still see service. So from one veteran to another, I honor you, I respect you, I reverence you, and above all, I salute you. Thank you.
Thank you, Natalie, for those inspirational words. <clears throat> At this time, we have Mr. Jack Malgieri. Please come forward and assist in this special presentation of awards. Good morning. We are honored today by the presence of three veterans who began their military service nearly 75 years ago. They all live currently at a retirement community for military personnel and their spouses called the Fairfax in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. They served at a time of a great apocalypse that threatened humanity and the freedom of every inhabitant of this world. I truly believe that the brilliant performance of our veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan derives in, in part from the traditions of honor and devotion to duty and courage exemplified by their forebears, the men and women who began their military careers in the 1940s. Each of these three men possess a deep sense of humility and simply say that they were doing their jobs as best they could during their wartime experiences. But they and their generation overcame daunting odds and personified selfless sacrifice in preserving our freedom and human rights across the world. Further service, we owe them and all veterans a debt that can never be fully repaid. Let me first introduce you to Colonel William DeGraff, Colonel William DeGraff is the youngest recipient of a battlefield commission in the history of the United States military during the Second World War. Colonel DeGraff enlisted in the Army in 1943. He became a commissioned officer in combat six days after his 19th birthday in 1944. Colonel DeGraff fought with bravery and distinction in campaigns in France and Germany and was part of the successful effort to support General Patton's Third Army as they helped to liberate Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. After the war, Colonel DeGraff graduated first in his class from West Point and was immediately sent to Korea where he participated in the breakout from the Pusan perimeter in which the American Army was completely surrounded by overwhelming numbers of North Korean soldiers. Colonel DeGraff fought in Korea for over one year. In 1969, Colonel DeGraff became a brigade commander in the United States Army's Big Red One Division and saw combat in Vietnam for over one year. Colonel DeGraff spent two years in, on the national security staff at the White House and ended his exemplary 32 years of military service in 1974. Colonel Andrew O'Connor enlisted in the United States Army in 1940. As fate would have it, he was stationed at a place called Pearl Harbor on, on Hawaii. On December 7, 1941, when the Japanese began their surprise bombing attack, Colonel O'Connor grabbed his rifle and returned fire on dive bombing zeros and other enemy planes. While Colonel O'Connor lost 2,500 of his fellow service members, his generation was undaunted by, the, by this initial devastating attack. Colonel O'Connor spent the next four years of his life in brutal combat, moving from island to island, including service on Saipan and Okinawa, in which the United States Army and, Marine, and the United States Marine Corps engaged in brutal combat against an, an enemy that refused to surrender. Colonel O'Connor began his military service at the very beginning of the Second World War, and he saw it through to the very end. Colonel O'Connor retired from the United States Army after 28 years of distinguished service to our nation. Colonel, Colonel William Cormos enlisted in the United States Army right after Pearl Harbor and saw combat as an infantryman fighting with bravery and distinction in numerous battles in France and Germany throughout the Second World War. He operated a Browning automatic rifle. After his career in the Army, Colonel Comos joined the United States Air Force and served as an, as an officer for a combined 30 years of exemplary military service. In peacetime, 
Colonel Carmel used his knowledge as an engineer for, for productive purposes in, in our economy. He worked to build our nation's industrial capacity and prowess. I'm so proud that you three wonderful gentlemen could join us today. Please join me in recognizing these true American heroes. Thank you, Rear Admiral Thomas. Thank you, Natalie Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Jack Malgeri. And thank you to these brave heroes for their service to our nation. We can never repay you for everything that you've done. Now we will honor our 2016 Veterans Day recognition nominees. From the HUD field and regional offices, Brian Beachler, United States Marine Corps, who we honor here today posthumously. We lost our fallen comrade just this past August. And so he's here in memory and in spirit. Aljo Marine, United States Army Reserves. Andrea Hodge, United States Army. Patrick Morris, U.S. Army. James Berlinski, U.S. Army. David Sillery, U.S. Air Force. Barry Brown, U.S. Army. Brandon Poranchak, U.S. Army. Anthony McIntyre, U.S. Army. And Lyndon Acosta, U.S. Air Force, Carol Ward, U.S. Army, Vicki Gill, U.S. Army, Arnold Taylor, U.S. Army, Sarah Lee Lyons, U.S. Air Force, Ken Hamilton, U.S. Air Force, David Webster, U.S. Air Force, Sandra James, U.S. Army, Jonathan Fryer, U.S. Army, Pat Thorstad, U.S. Air Force, Sandra Lewis Payne, U.S. Army, Tim Strickland, U.S. Army. John Paul Denny, U.S. Army. Dan Garcia, U.S. Marine Corps. Joseph Pinnell, U.S. Army. John Denny, U.S. Army. Andrew Bergen Anton, U.S. Marine Corps. Carl Rhodes, U.S. Army. Keith Jones, U.S. Marine Corps. April Edmonds, U.S. Army. Oswald Scantleberry, U.S. Air Force, Air Power. Roger Jacobs, U.S. Army. Dennis Green, U.S. Air Force. James Bechtel, U.S. Air Force. Rowena Jose, U.S. Air Force. Ed Kovich, U.S. Army. Charles Jones, Jr., U.S. Air Force. Dawu Martin, U.S. Army. Jamie Ferrero, U.S. Army. Headquarters veterans, if you're in the audience, please stand when you hear your name. John Hines, U.S. Air Force. James Cunningham, U.S. Army. Delta Nichols, U.S. Army. Kimberly Scholes, U.S. Navy. Andrea Williamson, U.S. Army. John Beekman, U.S. Army. John Paul Denny, U.S. Army. Dan Garcia, U.S. Marine Corps. Joseph Pinnell, U.S. Army. And Dr. Edward Pringle, U.S. Air Force. Please join me and give these individuals a round of applause. Thank you, please be seated. We would also like to acknowledge everyone who assisted in the planning, organizing, and presentation of today's ceremonies, including the HUD senior leaders, Walter Airmore, our chair of the Veterans Affinity Group, who helped put all of this together. Let's give him a round of applause. The HUD Veterans Affinity Group members, the Navy League of the United States of America, the Oxygen Rescue Care Centers of America, Bugles Across America, the U.S. Library of Congress, the Veterans History Project of the American Folk Life Center, the Bethesda Jewish Congregation, the Military District of Washington Ceremonial Color Guard, the Montgomery County Public Schools, Prince George's County Public Schools, HUD Printing and Graphic Arts Branch, HUD Broadcasting, HUD Property Management Branch, HUD Office of Field Policy and Management, HUD Office of Public and Indian Housing, HUD Security, Miss Texas Belleza Latina 2016, 
the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Operations, and the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Let's give them a round of applause for their contributions and dedicated service to our veterans. Thank you, Mary. As a caveat to the presentation, for those of you here at HUD headquarters, please remain in the audience, in, excuse me, in the uh, auditorium following the ceremony. We do have something for you. Also, please be advised that we do have refreshments immediately following the ceremony on the other side of the wall. So for our closing remarks, please stand for a moment of silence and the playing of taps by Mr. Kirk Holmes. Taps is a bugle call played at dusk during flag ceremonies and at military funerals by the U.S. Armed Forces. The plan of taps will be followed by the benediction by Rabbi Schnitzer, which will conclude today's ceremony. Please pause for a moment of silence. soldier, to the veteran, these things I, who has not had the honor and privilege to serve, do not know. I do not know the sound of a bullet, the power of a blast, the blood of a comrade, the depth of your wound, the terror at midnight, the dread at dawn, your fear or your pain. But these things I know, the sound of your honor, the power of your courage, the blood of your wound, the depth of your strength, the terror that binds you, the dread that remains, and above all, your dignity and your valor. For these things we pray, the sound of your laughter, the sound of your voice, the blood of your yearning, the depth of your healing, the joy that frees you, the hope that remains, your wholeness and your love. Compassionate God, source of mercy, we pay tribute to those who have served our country to express our gratitude for their courage and selflessness, both those among us today and those of generations past. This nation, built by those born of this soil and those who have come here from the far corners of the earth, is on a continual journey towards its destiny. May we never let down those who have served in defense of this country. May we uphold the values of freedom, of the inherent dignity of every human being, by our own right conduct, by the kindness and tolerance we show to one another. May we lead the world by example and become, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, a light to the nations. Then will the labors and sacrifices of these veterans be honored not in words alone, but by our deeds. And let us say, Amen. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's ceremonies.